All right, let's jump into this, shall we? Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Let's send Max back there to, you know, watch them kids. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2. Where were we at last time? We made it through, uh, uh, we, we did a recap on uh, Ephesians, the, the church of Ephesus. We did a recap on that. And then we went through the persecuted church, which is uh, Smyrna. You guys remember? Okay. Um, let's do real quick and uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. I'm going to start with verse 8. We already looked at this. I'll just do this to kind of catch us up to uh, verse 12. So Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 8. And it says, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Okay, do you guys remember about Smyrna? Some of the things that we learned about that. It was a city that, that was Ephesus. Ephesus oh. lost its first love. Smyrna, uh, Ephesus incidentally, was um, like the largest city in Asia Minor. It was around 250,000. And some people estimate as high as 500,000 people that lived in Ephesus at the time of the writing. Now here we go. We jump down to Smyrna. And I believe it's one of the uh, the... Uh, it's not as, as large. It's not the smallest, but it's not as large. But it is one that um, I believe is still in existence today under a different name. Um, all that to say, they had gone through a time where they were 700 years before John wrote the book of Revelation. They had been defeated and destroyed and lay desolate for 300 years. And then they came back and then had grown and, and developed and so on and so forth. And so uh, it is a city that had a reputation of that once was dead, but now is alive. And so Jesus is coming in and he says, um, these, verse 8, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And so that means a lot more to them at that time with their reputation than it does to us. We look at that and we say, well, yeah, that's Jesus talking about Jesus, you know, wonderful. But this is actually an insight into, um, you know, their history. Chad? Did you have a thought or comment? Or a question? Yeah, sorry. Well, I was just going to say that there's two meanings to the name Smyrna. And the first one is myrrh. Yes. Yes, you're and right. The other is she knows. She knows. Yeah, she, knows. she knows. She knows. Um, I did hear that, that Smyrna was uh, also known as, as uh, you know, myrrh, known for myrrh. And myrrh, you guys know gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yeah. Remember, we, we burnt some of that um, frankincense uh, and myrrh. We, burnt, we had that for Christmas. And it's a, it's a resin. Well, it comes... Uh, 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 from what I understand, it's part of, it's part of the plant, part of a tree, uh, the resin that that's the the wonderful yummy yummy smell good stuff. Um, but the plant itself also has some healing properties, and you have to break it and crush it in order to access those things. And that kind of rings true to what these guys are going through. Uh, Jesus said, "I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not." Uh, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear 
any of those things which are about what you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So they're going to be going through tribulation. And we talked about this last week because Jesus doesn't stop us from going through tribulation. He says, be faithful through the tribulation. Why does God allow testing, trials, tribulation to occur in a believer's life? It is because it refines us. It purifies us. It's through tribulation we find out what we're made of. And God's kind of like, yep, that's right. You need to either rely on me or you did great relying on me. You need to learn these things, right? So he's saying uh, there's good news here. There's bad news. You're going to go through tribulation. The good news is it's not going to be forever. Okay? And in this case, it is uh, 10 days. He says 10 days. Now, there are a lot of different ideas on this, this, this phrase of 10 days because in this phrase... It doesn't necessarily mean 10, 24-hour time increments. Some people theorize that this view, uh, you know, this, this 10 days, they view it as 10 um, time frames. And uh, I, heard, I heard somebody say it like this. There's 10 time frames that Jesus is saying, you're going to go through suffering for 10 of these time frames. Now, incidentally, there are three ways that we can look at this. I'm going to come back to it incidentally in just a second. There are three ways that we need to look at the book of Revelation. Okay. When Jesus showed up to John, he said, I want you to, you know, say hey to seven letters, to seven churches. Um, there were seven, le- seven churches in existence. And Jesus knows them. And every word that he says in these letters is uniquely addressed to them. They get it. We, we today don't live in that culture, that understanding. We didn't live in Smyrna, so we don't understand it. We didn't live in Ephesus, so we don't quite get it from their perspective. But Jesus did write to people of that day and age. Okay? That being said, it was directly applicable to them. Okay? And history shows this. And historically, we can see some great key insights that Jesus is speaking to the churches. Okay? Now, that's one way to look at that. That was written for them then okay second way that we can look at this is uh, this is also written to us today every one of these churches even though Ephesus the church in Ephesus does not exist any longer matter of fact the entire city doesn't exist any longer 250,000 to 500,000 people just they don't live there no more everybody moved right um Every one of these churches are still in existence today. You have churches that are going and doing, and they're shakers and movers. But they have left their first love, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have churches kind of like this, the persecuted church. Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are doing a great job. Now, heads up, you're going to go through some, you know, some tribulation, some persecution. So there are churches that are still doing these things, Okay. There are churches who are still going through persecution. Um, and then you have what we're going to come to here in a minute is the compromising church. You have all these different aspects of church. And we can look at the world in which we live and we can say, yes, this is kind of, we can kind of identify ourselves or they can identify themselves with specifically this church. Thyatira, Smyrna, Pergamos, Ephesus, etc. Laodicea, right? So we can kind of look in. Uh, or people can look around and see, yeah, this is kind of where we're at. So in that sense, the second way that we can understand this is we can look at it from our perspective and see how these are applicable to us, okay? So it was applicable to them then. It's applicable to us now. The third way that people uh, look at this, am I losing you guys? Are you guys okay? The third way that people can look at this is that these are looking at... um, the church age, okay, as in dispensations. Church age, beginning with the apostolic age, or AIE, the church of Ephesus. Now, let me give you some dates real quick and why this is very, very interesting. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, come, I'll give you the dates in just a moment. 
But it goes from the, the, the church of Ephesus, the loveless church, to the persecuted church, which is Smyrna. Uh, then we have the compromising church, that's Pergamos. Then we have the corrupt church, which is Thyatira. Uh, then we have the dead church, which is Sardis. Then we have the faithful church, which is Philadelphia. Then we have the lukewarm church, which is Laodicea. Now, that's the seven churches. And what's crazy, crazy, crazy cool, only God could do this, is these, there is strong evidence to support the idea that historically speaking, there have been ages in the church history that these things have actually shown up. The... the the loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church, the faithful church, and the lukewarm church. Now, if this is true, historically speaking, we would be at the end of the faithful church and going into the what's called the lukewarm church, historically speaking. Okay, So that means we could look in our, if we went backwards in our history, presently we're the lukewarm church, before that was the faithful church, before that would have been the dead church. Then you'd have the corrupt church. Then you'd have the compromising church. Then you'd have the persecuted church. Then you'd have the loveless church. Okay? Now, th that being said, when Jesus is speaking here in, you know, to the persecuted church, Smyrna, he says, uh, you, you will be uh, in tribulation for 10 days. If we understand this from that third perspective, that this is church ages, it's funny to me that it was 10 emperors until Constantine. 10 emperors. 10 days, 10 times. The church went through persecution. If we see that, if we can understand that, then we can give merit to that. Now, am I advocating one idea above the other? I'm really not because this was written to them then. It's written to us now. But it's also written in a historical fashion to the church, to, to the church age, right? So let me read this because this is so powerful uh, if you understand that, okay? I'm going to read from a book. It's called Revelation, Four Views, a Parallel Commentary, edited by Steve Gregg. Um, this is a church that was found on the shelf here at the, at the church. Um, one of the, it belonged to the church, and then we were getting rid of the, buy, the books and stuff, and so I, I snatched this one up personally. Yay for myself. <laughs> All right. This is, this is cool. It says, uh, and they break it down into four different schools of thought that historically speaking, people have had different schools of thought in the book of Revelation, how to interpret the book of Revelation. And I don't agree with all of them. Uh, any almost... There's two of them I strongly disagree with, but there are views. I see, um, you know, some views that I, I, I give merit to. Uh, that being said, I believe, again, my personal view on the church and on world history and on the scriptures is a what you would call a premillennial, pre-tribulation dispensationalist. Okay, that's the 10-gallon word, dispensationalist. What does that mean? They're dispensations, i.e. time frames. After, and the Bible itself has some degree of dispensationalism because we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. What does that mean? That God changed? No, it means it's a different dispensation, a different way to approach the things of God. We had to go through the blood of sheep and goats under the Old Testament for partial forgiveness that covered our sins but under the new covenant, we go through Jesus Christ, which cleanses our sins, washes them away, okay? So that's, that's one way to understand dispensationalism. Well, since the time of the Gospels, there's the Gospels, then you have the book of Acts. At the book of Acts, we have the birth of the church. We have what is called now the age of grace. Has anybody ever heard that, that term, the age of grace? Okay? It's after the crucifixion, after the death burial and resurrection and ascension, you have now the age of grace. God's grace is given. Uh, Paul is specifically speaking in, in 
uh, the book of Acts, I believe it's Acts chapter 20, where he says, listen, God has, has let some stuff go, but he's calling all men everywhere to repent. You guys remember that? We read that a couple weeks ago. He's saying God wants us to repent. Why? Because he's given us a time frame, an age, a time frame. And we're going to see that actually as we go on uh, to the next church, uh, the compromising church. You're going you're to see a time frame that Jesus gave for people to re- repent. It's an age of grace. And today we have a lot of abuse of the age of grace. We think just as they did back in the, uh, in the New Testament, we think that, hey, we can sin and get away with it and it's going to be okay. But the apostle warns us, you can't do that. You can't sit there and trample the blood of Jesus underfoot like it means nothing. Like his sacrifice on the cross means nothing. You can't do that and think that you're off the hook. You're putting your salvation in jeopardy when you're perpetually living in sin and refusing to repent. You can't do that. It doesn't work, okay? So um, now that being said, here we go. Here's kind of the breakdown or the dates. If you're keeping notes, this is a great place to state or to start, okay? Here's a panorama of the age of the church, the ages of the church. Ready? On the first view, the letter to Ephesus is said to describe the church during the apostolic age until about A.D. 100. So after John dies, then the apostolic age ended, or the church of Ephesus, that time frame, ended. Okay? Then you have Smyrna. That's A.D. 100. Uh, Then you have Smyrna. Eight, it, from 0 to 100 A.D. Okay, it's during the lifetime of the ap- apostles. Okay. okay. Then you have Smyrna, the church enduring persecution and is likened to the church from about uh, 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. Something very significant in church history happened in 313 A.D. But between 100 and and 313, so 213 years, there had been multiple emperors that rose to power. Okay? And during those times, there was like 10 different emperors that rose to power that persecuted and hated the church. There are other people who are indifferent that did not care one way or the other. But in 313, something happened. Okay, um, so Smyrna, the church enduring persecution, is likened to the church from about 100 to 313 A.D., which suffered under a series of Roman emperors. Pergamos is a church uh, comprised with carnality and false doctrine, much as the church became from Constantine's edict of tolerance in 313. Now, at 313, to understand this book, the book of Revelation, to understand this from this perspective, church ages, okay? You have to understand one of the emperors rose up in power. His name was Constantine. Constantine went out. He was, he was kind of kicked out of Rome. Uh, he went out and he was conquering the world and doing everything. And he said he saw a vision of the cross in the, in this, in the heavens. And it really you know, moved him. It touched him. So he embraced Christianity, And he went back into Rome bringing this new vision, this new ideology that, hey, Christians are our friends. We're going to fight for them, not against them. And incidentally, because there was so much hatred and persecution that was taking place, this is martyr of the catacombs. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, up to that point in time, these people had been martyred for the cause of Christ. Martyred, like bad stuff. I mean, this is the, 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 the Roman Colosseum. This is when they go out as martyrs. They, they, they sick the, the, the hungry animals on them. Or they have the gladiators, you know, go and kill them and wipe them out. So, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, at this point in time, Constantine comes back. And in 313, as emperor, he now says, I'm issuing an edict of tolerance. It's called the Edict of Tolerance. Now, what this Edict of Tolerance did... Asher, you've got to go, buddy. Uh, what this Edict of Tolerance did was it said... Everybody, we're going to be tolerant of them. But they took it to the next step. At this point in time, Christians now were able to rise and to, and to become, you know, like government employees. And they started working for, and they advanced in ranks until you have, you know, uh, 
you know, vice presidents, so to speak, in our day and age. They, they, they rose in authority and in place of power, you know, through the ranks until they could actually uh, come under power, you know, mayors, governors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at this point in time, because Christianity had been so persecuted and now is so widely accepted, the, the, the Roman the edict went from not just an edict of tolerance, but actually started to push people into Christianity. Such is the case, what we see in world history right now today uh, with, with uh, Islam, they conver conversion by the sword. We have uh, a dear friend, a, a missionary partner that we support at this church, Grady Pickett. I went to school at Ramah with him. He has spent his entire uh, ministry over in Iraq. And in Iraq, there are people who are Muslim by force. They don't want to be Muslim, but they have to be Muslim or else they will die or else they'll be persecuted. Their family will. Now, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, you want to kill me? Fine. All right, kill me. I still believe in Jesus. Okay, great. We're not just going to kill you. We're going to kill your wife, yeah. your kids. We're going to not stop there. We're going to go ahead and slaughter your entire family. Anybody that knows your name. Yes. Yeah, say, say that again, Paul, if you don't mind. <laughs> Keep that down there next to him. <laughs> I was just saying that they'll kill, you know, they won't kill him first. They'll, they'll watch him. They'll, he'll they'll make the family go first. The family die first. And then during that course, he's going to change his mind. I mean, if they're, if, they're on, if they're not a very strong Christian, which, yeah. you know, they're kind of killing them in their infancy, so to speak, mm -hmm. a baby Christian, uh, you know, an adult person, but a baby Christian, and they're snuffing out their little lights. So Grady comes across a lot of people who are silent Christians or, or, or uh, Christians who love Jesus, but on the outside have to partake, partake in the, uh, the, the prayer calls and oh, yo, go, yo, yo, go, go, go. and they have to go and, you know, bow down and face west or east or whatever, east, I believe. Well, anyways, the point is, um, they have to face Mecca, what, whatever direction that is from where they're at. Um, point is, that's how Christians were at in world history. So Christianity actually goes through some very brutal, nasty things. That being said, after the Edict of Tolerance was issued by Constantine, Christians went about forcing people. And, and you can, you can kind of remember, you know, when I say the Dark Ages and the Crusades, mm -hmm. that's kind of under this whole same similar thought pattern. Thought, you know, we're going to go take back Jerusalem, King, you know, King Richard the Lionheart, blah, blah, blah. And they're going to do all these, you know, wonderful things in the name of God. But they're, what they're doing is they're slaughtering people in the name of God. And there is forced conversion. They're forcing people to convert to Christianity. Hi, guys. Come on in. Uh, and so that is during this time. Now, that's, that's church history. That's, that's Christian, you know, part of our Christian heritage, which is funk, funk, stink, stank, stunk. Right? <laughs> it, it's, it's no good. So that is, again, uh, the church of Pergamos is compromised with carnality and false doctrine, much of the church became, uh, or much as the church became from Constantine's edict of tolerance in 313 until the rise of the papacy in about AD 500. So from 313 to 8500, AD 313 to 8500. Now Thyatira is seen as the papal church until the Reformation from about 8500 to uh, 1500. So now you have about a thousand years that we see. And that's the Thyatira church. Okay. Then we have uh, Ansardis as the church during the Reformation itself from about 1500 to 1700. So about 200 years. Then we have Philadelphia uh, which is regarded as corresponding to the church, with, which experienced a resurgence of missional activity, 1700 to present. That would be now, uh, Philadelphia is the faithful church. Then we come to now the lukewarm church, which is Laodicea. 
to present, to now. Okay, so we're still in the, what, what you would call the faithful church. But now it's followed by the Laodicean church, which was lukewarm and is likened to liberal churches of modern times. Okay? So that kind of gives us some insight, some glimpse into uh, why people can see these churches as time frames. Why? Because when we, if we think about this in the time frame since, then we can see some very, very strong parallels in church history and world history. Okay? Uh, so those are the dates. Uh, those are, you know, the, the, the times, so to speak, of what's going on when, and when they're going on. All right? Now, let's go ahead and jump into, back into um, where we are here in Revelation chapter 2. Okay? Now, why is what I just said, how does that relate to all this? Well, it's good to know. Kind of put it in the back of your mind. But also, if you apply that viewpoint perspective... If you apply that to what we just read, when Jesus said, um, verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation for 10 days. There's good news and bad news. Bad news is you're going to go through tribulation. Good news is it's going to be a limited time frame. But if we're viewing at this from a church age perspective... It's incidental that there were 10 emperors. So 10 time frames that churches, the church went through severe persecution. Okay? Uh, and then I want to point out something that we've not really seen yet. Remember when Jesus was on the earth, he, had, he would consistently say, He who has an ear, let him hear. Okay? But now, as he is writing these letters, Jesus says, he who has an ear, look at it on, on the, uh, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's jump down to verse 11. He says, he who has an ear, the last, uh, or, or right here, verse 11. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Jesus is completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit working in and through the lives of the believers. That's important, guys. That's important. Because we are, we, we're viewed as, as spirit-filled people. We're viewed as Pentecostals, right? Charismatics. And that's sometimes in a negative content or context. But I, I, I urge you, Consider the fact that Jesus is calling us to rely on the Holy Spirit. And during these church ages, it's important, it's imperative. And Jesus says this again and again. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And again, that is a promise following, um, you know, if you do what I'm asking you to do, eternal life is your reward. And he packages it different ways to these different churches for unique reasons. And we can see that. Again, there's three ways that we can view these churches, the letters to the churches, okay? They were written to the people then, there. They're written to us here and now. But they're also written in a sense of church history from when it started till now or to the end, okay? Does that make sense? Now let's go on to uh, the compromising church, okay? The church of Pergamos. Does anybody have any questions or comments real quick? Okay. Here we go. Verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp, two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas 
was uh, my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Praise God forevermore. Now, like what? Oh, she has a, she has a, keep that one there. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. Uh, so yes. we're going to have a new name. Um, there's three ways that, that uh, people have interpreted that verse, and I think that there's merit in all three ways. Um, okay, uh, we'll, we'll jump into that real quick. Um, it says in verse 17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And, again, implying he who overcomes, and I will give him a white stone on the stone, a new name written that nobody, uh, no one knows except him who receives it. Um, the first way that that, that idea is um, understood or, you know, back in the day, biblical time, there were judges that would, they would pronounce judgment and you know, like kind of like a, um, uh, what is it called today when your peers, what, uh, jury duty, okay? And the people would hear the cases, and then you would have a white stone and a black stone. And if you found the person innocent, they would throw in a white stone. If you found the person guilty, they would throw in the black stone. And then when all the stones were thrown in, they would go through and count. And if it was, you know, all, you know, if it was majority white, then the person would pronounce, get this, innocent. Innocent, Okay. Now, that's one way to interpret that. In light of the fact that what Jesus is saying, he says, uh, take into consideration the entire letter, he says to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, okay? And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. You did not deny my faith. You did not deny my faith even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And I have a few things against you, because you, you, have, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat the things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. And thus you also have these who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. To him, uh, and, and I will give him a white stone. In other words, I will pronounce him innocent to him who overcomes overcomes what well right in the middle of the doctrine of the nicolaitans right in the middle of the doctrine of balaam we had to unpack that to understand it but the second way that you can understand this is when uh in the greek games uh, no she's not in this one yet yeah not yet jezebel jezebel will be mentioned here in the next church the corrupt church Okay, uh, but 
in the Greek games, think of like uh, Hercules and all that, you know, um, they would do the Greek games. Very, very similar to our Olympics today. Matter of fact, the name uh, Olympics come from Mount Olympus, the Greek games, etc. During the time when, like say, they would run a race, there, there would be runners. Okay, mm -hmm. the person who won first place would be given a white stone. That would be until they could stand and receive, uh, it was a crown, the, 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 you know, the, the, the wreath. Okay, uh, I want to say Stephanos, I might be, I don't believe that that's correct. There's a diadem and a Stephanos, I think it was a Stephanos. Um, it was, a, you know, the crown, the crown, the victor's crown. Well, they didn't get that the, the moment that they ran. They got what? And in their culture, they would give them a white stone with their name on it. Now, this is interesting. Now, this is applicable, too, because if Jesus is saying, hey, listen, he who overcomes, what do you do? You stayed faithful. You stayed the course. You stayed true. And right now, I will give you a stone with your name on it. And that's going to be representative because when it's time to tally up, you're going to receive a crown. Well, that also has great implications for us today, okay? Does that make sense? There was a third way, and I'm going to... Uh, oh, the third way that they looked at this, this stone is also going back into their culture. Uh, they would have, um, during these pagan rituals and whatnots, uh, and that's what Jesus, okay, look at real, cl real quick at verse 14. It says, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of, of Israel to, okay, check this out, to eat things sacrificed to idols. That in their culture was pagan feasts. Okay, And during these times of pagan feasts, there would be a lot of booze, a lot of alcohol, a lot of wine, mead, beer, whatever. Um, they would have a lot of feasting and a lot of alcohol and a lot of drinking, a lot of partying and revelry, which would turn into, oh my goodness, what it says in verse, again, same verse, um, sexual immorality. And to commit, okay, verse 14. Um, uh, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things uh, sacrificed to idols. Okay, so there's a feast that included a lot of drinking and they would commit sexual immorality. And they did this in the name of God, their gods, and the name of worship. Now, this was not always available to the general public. This was available to those who had a, a, a pass, a ticket, okay? And how it would be viewed as the pass, they would have something with their name on it. Something that could not be readily forged would be like, I don't know, let's say a white stone with your name on it. And so Jesus is saying, if you overcome, I have a feast. And you'll be admitted to my feast. The brides, the lambs, you know, feast, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's a third way that you can understand that. Does that mean up in heaven that we're going to receive new names? No, I don't believe that. I believe that I will be Jimmy forever. Okay, well, know. you know, James, Jimbo, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimster, <laughs> Jimbalina never really worked. <laughs> glory and it's mine yes it's mine sure and again why would we have that is based upon only one scripture from the scriptures um i am unaware is there any is there a second scripture that, that says that we're going to receive a different name up in heaven a new name i'm unaware of any well that to say traditions can be based upon one scripture does not make the tradition true the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Well, let's apply that to this. 
if this is only one scripture passage where Jesus says, I'm going to give you a new name, uh, you know, a stone with a, n- a name on it. Oh, let's be careful that we don't make that into a doctrine that we adhere to so adamantly because we don't know that that's the case. I just gave you three ways that we could look at this. We could look at this as um, a ticket, a pass to his banquet, to his meal, to his feasting and festivities. Yes, sir. No, no, no. It should be on. Oh, did you? Oh, it's going to take a minute then to reset because Chad will let you know when it's reset. Do you have to go clear back there? No. Okay. I'm kind of wondering about a couple of things. Okay. On, um, well, the name for one thing. Uh-huh. I, and while you were saying that, uh, as far as your name's going to be Jimmy, there's, there's going to be too many Jimmys in there. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm getting at, I mean, God is a God that he's so infinite that he can give you a name that nobody else has. You know what I mean? And That's then, entirely possible, too. I'm not going to discount that, but we don't have verses to, to, to I, support I that. I'm just, I'm kinda, you know, I mean, it's yeah. also a good possibility, Paul, that when he speaks the name Jimmy, that the person that he's speaking to knows that it's them. Well, Such is the case when my mom walks in the room, and you could say Jimmy, and she could say Jimmy, and I'm going to go right here. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to go right to because. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, like uh, Arlene's, uh, one of Arlene's prayer requests tonight was, uh, in, we want to pray for Jimmy. I'm not thinking, what do you know? What did you see me do? No, I, I, <laughs> no I'm, not think, I'm not thinking that at all. But I, I know she's not talking about me, you know. But, but again, if she was, now, for the sake of argument, if she was God, I would be perking up. You know, why, why, why pray for Jimmy? Oh, my goodness. What do you know that I don't know? You know, I'd be a little bit nervous until, oh, oh, Jimmy, the other Jimmy. Oh, whew, close call. So, but is that possible? It is possible, you know. It kind of dawned on me when you said that. And then the other thing I had uh, in mind, a question about or maybe a thought, is it says he taught them to worship idols by eating food offered to the idols. I think when you were talking about about liquor, I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm bad at eating too much. I, 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 is it gluttony? Is it like, do I get the double cheeseburger instead <laughs> of the burger with no cheese and single <laughs> patty? You know what I mean? I mean, sure. And I. I hope that that's not an idol to me or I don't know just kind of a tough thought it's definitely that's a good thought and and uh one of two ways to look at that Paul you know food uh is it eating it to idols or not um the reality is like if I'm going to the drive through I'm not thinking you know I'm thinking hey I'm hungry I need to eat because you know that's what we do uh when you're hungry right I'm not thinking you know paganism I'm not thinking, oh, I need to eat for Zeus's sake. You know, I don't think like that. Nobody in their right mind really thinks like that. But however, the Bible also indicates from several passages that people's stomach can become their God. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it doesn't mean just their stomach, like my belly, that's my God, I'm little Buddha here. No, it's not talking like that. It's, it's meaning, it's indicating their appetites are what drive them. And that could be their belly, could be their God, could be sexual immorality. Their appetites of, you know, uh, I remember hearing uh, many years ago and studying, you know, um, you guys remember this, this movie that came out. It was, you know, melted to everybody. It was uh, Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith. You guys remember that movie? Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith. It said in there that Joseph had a voracious, I'll never forget this word, a voracious, I'd never heard that word, but as soon as I heard it, I understood it. A Joseph Smith had a voracious appetite for women. And I thought, I don't even need to look that up. I get it. Well, what is that? That is, you know, your God is your belly and maybe perhaps a little further south. 
you know, it would be your, your drives, you know. No, no, that was uh, King Solomon, but yes, uh, well, he had he had a few he had a he had a handful of wives himself. <laughs> no, not to make sure he was dead. They said that he they put a young a young virgin in his bed to to keep him warm, and I'm sure it was. I used I. I used to tease my wife. I said, let's, let's, hey, you know what hypothermia is? And she says, uh, yeah, that's when you fall in the water, right? You got to, you know, uh, strip down and, and stand before the fire and warm up. I said, let's practice hypothermia. Let's just practice it. Why? So that we get really good at it. What is that? Get naked and bundle up real close together, you know? <laughs> well, we got four kids, and so it worked. We were, <laughs> sorry, we better move along. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, at any rate, <laughs> what 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 we're looking at is the fact that um, you know your your appetites toward your idols could that be you know just unhinged appetites or self-seeking appetites? Yes, but I won't say absolutely. If you are perpetually in a state of, of gluttony and you never practice, and I know you practice fasting. So I, w- you're obviously putting a, s- a roadblock in that direction. And so that to me is, uh, well, should I get the double or should I? When I'm sitting there, I'm looking, what's going to, what's going to, you know, what looks good to me? I'm hungry, you know, mm, 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 chicken sandwich, double quarter pounder, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with what, what seems appealing at the moment. Now, I'm not sitting here thinking, mm, oh, how can I develop my cravings of McDonald's even deeper? No, I, there's professionals out there trying to do that. And they're paid very well to, you know, market it and make it taste even better. Put all kind of MSGs, right? All right. So there's... <laughs> all right, let's come back to this. So there's three ways that, that we can look at the stones, okay? Uh, again, one of them was like a ticket to the banquet. And in this case, Jesus is offering the ticket to his banquet, kind of the, the, uh, a better banquet opportunity. Listen, if you're faithful, I'll, I'll take care of you. You know, I'll take care of you. You won't go without, okay? Another way that we can look at this as uh, in, the, in the Greek games, they would be, you know, immediately after winning, they were given just a temporary stone with their name on it until they could stand before the people in, in your, you know, your glory for, you know, doing what you did and receiving your crown, which is a very cool analogy that Jesus would offer to us today as well. Uh, so that, I believe, I, there's merit in that as well. But then the third one that we see merit in is, um, in the judicial sense, to be pronounced innocent. And that's very powerful. Now, that all of those three things have absolute biblical merit in. And we're okay with saying... You know, well, which one is it? Uh, uh, maybe all of them. Maybe, maybe there's something else that he knows that we don't know, and that's entirely possible too. But you have to take into consideration that he's writing to Thyatira. Is that right? No, excuse me, Pergamos. He's writing to Pergamos. And this is very, very uh, important because... I said Thyatira. This is very important. He's writing to Pergamos because they get it. They understand it. Now, diving into their culture to understand their culture, um, how his words are so much more relevant uh, will help us to understand it, okay? Something interesting about Pergamos. It's also called Pergamum, okay? It was the uh, provincial capital of Asia. If Ephesus was it, it would be like in Ephesus would be likened to New York City, whereas Pergamos would be likened unto Washington D.C. Okay, so Pergamos or Pergamum, um, very large. It had the second largest library in the world. It contained containing uh, 
200,000 volumes exceeded only by the library in Alexandria, uh, or at Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, it was also the oldest city of Asia. Pergamos was the first to, now get this, Pergamos, Pergamum, this one, was the first city to erect temples to Caesar Augustus, to Zeus, and to the serpent god, uh, I, I'm going to see if I can pronounce this, Asclepius, 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 I don't know. Um, he's considered to be the god of healing, a serpent god, Asclepius, or something to that effect. And that when I saw that it's a serpent god and it's attributed to healing, I'm thinking, whoa, yeah. hold up. Yeah. Isn't that kind of our symbol today? But I always thought that in the American symbol, why a serpent? Because I remember a time where Moses put the serpent on the brazen serpent. If, if you want to know where that is, go to John 3, verse 16. Because, or actually, verse 15, because Jesus says, is it 15 or 17? It's on either side of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right before that, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man must be lifted up. So going back to Moses, the serpent in the wilderness, there was all these fiery snakes that came in because the people were, you know, uh, 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 complaining. They were, they were complaining. They were, uh, crybaby, whatever. They were doing all this stuff and it really was upsetting to God because God was supernaturally taking care of their needs. They started complaining, so fiery serpents came throughout. Does that mean they was on fire? No, but I'm sure that when they bit you, it felt like the, the venom was on fire in your veins and there's a lot of people that describe snake bites today with the venom going through their veins as fire, fire in their veins. So uh, anyways, these fiery serpents came through. They are bitten biting people, and it was wiping people out, and uh, Moses said, God, what do we do? God says, go make a brazen serpent, put it up on the pole, and as soon as somebody looks at that pole, that serpent, they will immediately be healed, mm -hmm. and so Moses did that, God did that, the people did that, wonderful story, and so therefore, we thought, hey, maybe that's what it's, you know, that's why a serpent is, is included in the our, our badge for, for the medical industry, you know, on the, on the ambulance and stuff like that. Um, well, is it possible that it's not? Because here we have a Greek god who is being erected in this, the oldest city. It's the capital city. And the Greek god, his name was... Uh, okay, they did the, the first temple uh, erected to Caesar Augustus to Zeus, and to the serpent god Asclepius. It's A-S-C-L-E-P-I-U-S. -E Again, A-S-C-L-E-P-I-U-S. -E you pronounce it however you want to. He is considered the god of healing. Uh, and the people would journey to Pergamos seeking cures for their ailments. Uh, 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 you have to use the microphone. I know, I'm trying to get your attention. Sorry. Okay, so we just looked up the serpent on the medical, all, all the medical, medical snake symbol. And it says the Confucius is a staff carried by Hermes in Greek mythology and consequently by Hermes Okay, uh, so it's going back to some Greek mythology and then also some Egyptian mythology. It's not necessarily being attributed to Moses uh, on the serpent. Now, could they have gotten their idea from Moses? It's very possible, but it's not where America is attributing their, they're going back to Greek mythology and beyond um, in their symbol for the, which is kind of a downer, right? Kind of a bummer, like, oh, shucks, right? Well, is it <laughs> 
symbol across though? On the it's a it's a pole. I I, I don't believe. One of them's a sword. It looks more like a sword, but it has the cross, yeah. like with the hilt of the sword. Mm -hmm. A little cross. Yeah, it's one of them's just a straight pole. With Microphone, please. One of them's just a straight pole with a, a like almost like a needle. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one's like a, a cross, but it's more like a sword than a cross for the different symbols that are associated with the medical. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, microphone. You know, when you think about it, because you've got a needle in there, needle is what? You stitch up something, so you stitch up a sore or a wound. Sure. And the other thing is, they used to use steak venom to try to heal you at one time. In fact, they still <laughs> use it today. They also use fly dung. <laughs> That's true, too. They've used some walloper stuff in yeah, world history. <laughs> they would probably Give use that die. as a cure. Give it die. Good. Lord, I, I mean, don't want to confuse uh, this little study, Ray, this little bit here, but Adam and Eve... They were tempted by the serpent. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> hold on, hold on. We'd be happy to let you guys share. Just uh, let us know so we can okay. record it for everybody. Um, I was reading the... Commentary. Commentaries. And it says something about, on this chapter... Um, Nothing is known about Anipus except that he did not compromise. Uh, however, some in the church were tolerating those who taught or practiced what Christ opposed. Compromise can be defined as a blending of the qualities of two different things or a concession of principles. And so that's what they were doing there. <coughs> mm -hmm. Participation that could lead to immoral practices. And um, there's no room for heresy or moral impunity. Um, later, Balaam influenced the Israelites to, to turn to idol worship. And here Christ rebuked the church for tolerating those who, like Balaam, led people away from God. And this war that it mentions is God's judgment against rebellious nations and all forms of sin. Yes, yeah, I agree. That's the uh, two-edged sword that's being mentioned at the beginning. Now, uh, let's look at Antipas for a moment, shall we? Let's kind of break that down. Uh, you're, you're correct. Nothing beyond what is said right here by Jesus, nothing is understood or known about an individual in church history named Antipas. Um, however, that being said, if the view of, uh, you know, again, the, the different disp dispensations, okay, what is the, uh, the, this church, uh, uh, Pergamos, that's the third church, what is the third church age? What is the time frame? The first is to up to 100 A.D., mm -hmm. and then from 100 to 313, then from 313 to 500, okay? What happened at 500? The rise of what's called the papacy. Do you understand what the papacy means? What that means, what that is in church history? Okay. That's the Pope. The Pope. Okay. The rise of the Pope, 500 AD. Now this becomes very, very, very interesting. Why? Because let's look at the context again. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 12. It says, To the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. In other words, the sword that truly judges. Okay? The one with the authority. Okay? I know your works and where you dwell. Where Satan's throne is. Again, he's speaking to the Washington, D.C. of that day. The governmental seat of power. Okay, Ephesus being the largest city, but Washington being the powerful one. And he's saying Satan's throne is set up up in here, okay? 
uh, and what's going on with Satan's throne. Uh, he says, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and you do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, underline that, Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Uh, but I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. We're going to look at Balaam here in just a moment. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. There's the second key. Which thing I hate. Okay? And Jesus says, repent. Now, there's two keys right here that give us a, an indication, not only in their culture and their history, this is the, the, the chief city, the first, the oldest city. Um, more knowledge is passed around in this city, the great big library, etc., etc. This is the place where they erected the first statue to Caesar Augustus. They, they erected a, 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 or not statue, uh, was, it, was it a statue or, or no, it was a temple. Uh, a temple to Caesar Augustus. So this would have been what's called emperor worship. It's also like the worship of Zeus. It's also the worship of um, the serpent god, Aclepius. Okay, at, at any rate, okay, there's three specially noted words, okay, names, if you would. Balaam, well, first Antipas in verse 13. In verse 14, Balaam. Verse 15, the Nicolaitans. We know from our previous study back in, in the church of Ephesus that the, ne the Nicolaitans, um, compound Greek word, it means to conquer the laity. To conquer the laity. There's two ways that that shows up in the church today. It's to have the minister or the priest or the bishop or whatever the case is, the minister, to say, if you want to get to God, come through me. All absolve you of your sins okay that's going to tick jesus off matter of fact it does he says i hate that because he is the only high priest he's the only one that can mediate between god and man okay book of hebrews is very clear on this subject is there anybody else that can forgive us our sins no now mankind to a to a degree, it says, you know, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Confess your sins one to another and you will be forgiven. Uh, okay, I get that. But I'm going to say intrinsically, you don't have the power or the authority to forgive and to cleanse and wash away somebody else's sins. Yes, can. God can. Okay. Hold on. Don't talk unless you have the microphone. <laughs> Paul, you had a thought real quick? Right there. Hold on, Paul's, Paul's up. I'm, I'm always interested in what names mean. Yeah. And the word Antipas is pronounced Antipatros. Don't go there yet. Don't go there yet. You're probably on the same hot trail. You tell me in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Don't, hey, you're letting the cat out of the bag, buddy. <laughs> okay, there's three names mentioned. All right, we're looking at Nicolaitans. Uh, Nicolaitans. Uh, and then what that means, it means to conquer the laity. It means uh, you got to go through the priest or the pope or whatever to get your sins absolved. You have to go through them to get, um, you know, to reach, to, to get to God. Okay. And we do see that in the world today. Pardon? Ugh, I don't know. Ask somebody else. L-A-Y, I think. Okay. L-A-I-T-Y is laity, how do you spell? Okay, Miss, Miss, uh, Miss Erlene. Okay, today we can confess our sins like I go up and I say, you know, I've really messed up. And I can say, well, I messed up because I can't do this and I've had problems. But that's confessing a sin too. Sure. But uh, on the other hand, she isn't forgiving me for it. She's just telling me to take care of now it. Now she can, and to a limited degree, she can forgive you of your sins if you sin against them. 
Right. If I sinned okay, against if you sinned against, you know, George, Sally, Bob, Sue, well, whoever, you, you know, and you confess, hey, I'm really sorry. They can forgive you of your sins. But just because they forgive you of your sins doesn't mean that, that at this God point in time me. that God is you're clear with God. So it's very important that we be sure that we're clear with God. OK, right. um, that being right. said, uh, them, Jesus. you going to heaven or hell is not dependent upon them. Not George, Sally, me. Bob, Sue, or whoever. Me. Okay, no, it's not even dependent on you. It's a bit, well, dependent upon you calling on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right, but if I okay. don't confess to the Lord, and I don't right. let go of Whoever calls name. upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. saved. Okay, right. um, so, okay, so that's the first way that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans mm -hmm. shows up. Second way that it shows up in a church today is to say, Pastor, we're holding you to a higher standard. How come you're doing this, this, and this? We can do this. We're not the pastor, but you can't do this because you are the pastor. Hold on. That's putting the pastor above the people. That can't be the case. Before God, we are all priests unto God. Okay, so that's very important. So that's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And this is running rampant in this church. People are compromising to this. They're making place for this, making provision for this. And this is unacceptable to this, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's being allowed in this church. It's being tolerated. Second thing that we need to look at is the doctrine of Balaam. Now, if you go back and I'll just reference this. You can check this out. Numbers chapter 22, 23, 24, 25. 22 through 25, Numbers 22 through 25, it gives the account of Balaam. You guys remember the story. Uh, um, this king comes and he, Balak, he sends for Balaam because he has a reputation that whoever he curses gets cursed. Whoever he blesses gets blessed. And he sends, and I'm going to pay this, this prophet, this whatever, this, this guy, I'm going to pay him well for coming out and cursing the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. They're, they're walking through the desert with Moses right here, right now. Numbers, chapter 22, 23, 24, 25. He, they're walking through the desert. And he says, I want you to curse these people because every time they come against somebody, they win decisively. And I want them to be cursed. And so Balaam says, well, I'll, I'll pray to God and see what he says. God says, no, you cannot go. Ah, oh, bad news, sorry, I can't go. So they go back to the king. He said, sorry, can't go. No, go take a bigger paycheck. Go to give him a bigger checkbook. Go take more gold. Show up. I'm going to send some nicer looking people. Okay, you guys failed. Off with their heads. Send out the next crew. Make them dress nicer. You know, send them in the caddy this time, right? <laughs> send them in the limo. You know, we're, we're going to really wine and dine them. They go to him and they say, hey, hey, look, 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 buddy. We brought you some treasures, some gold. Are you sure? Oh, oh, golly. Well, let me go find out. <laughs> let me go pray. And God, God says, look, if they come and ask you again, then go. But only do what I say. So he does not wait. He gets up the next morning and says, okay, I can go now. And so now God's angry. Because he never said that he could go. He said, if they come and ask, then you do only what I say. He doesn't wait for God. So that's why God's so cheesed when he gets on his donkey He's strolling down the road and his donkey, you know, curbs out on one side, curbs out on the other side, throws him in the ditch on the other side, puts him into the tree on the other side. And he's so ticked off, he starts walloping and whooping this donkey. The donkey collapses. He just stops in the middle of the road, just stops. And he starts wailing on this donkey and the donkey, the Lord allows the donkey to open up his mouth and speak with the voice of a man. And I take great encouragement knowing that some dumbass could speak. <laughs> And God was speaking through him. <laughs> well, it really was in a biblical sense. And I love it because, because if you go back to the King James, it's a beautiful story. Jesus shows up in the angel and he says, why are you kicking your own ass? It said that in the King James. I love it. I, I laughed. I laughed so hard. I texted my mom and said, you got to read this in the King James. It'll, it'll tickle you funny because Jesus is saying you're kicking your own butt. But that's how we interpret it. That's not how it was... <laughs> He's saying if, if there's a dumb donkey and he opens his mouth and he speaks the oracles of God, the things of God, wake up, dude, I've never been unfaithful. I've always taken you, I've never complained. And then God opens up Balaam's eyes, he sees. Well, the story goes on. He goes up there and he says, I can only say what God says. That's it. So he goes and he's, he pronounces, the king takes him up. They do his little sacrifice. King takes him up and he goes up and he starts pronouncing blessings, blessings, blessings over the people. And 
The king's mad. So he says, well, here, let's try it from this angle over here. So he circles the camp, comes up over another outcropping, looking at all these hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people, and he's, he just starts pronouncing, he, he does the sacrifice again, and then he starts pronouncing blessings. So the king's really mad. So he takes him, well, let's go try it from this side. He's like, look, dude, I can only do what God's telling me to do. That's it. And so he goes up there and he pronounces his little cur- or blessing again. It's supposed to be a curse, but it ends up being a blessing. And then he says something very profound and, and prophetic in the sense of uh, uh, what he says. It's actually something that, you know, is God a man that he should lie? Is the son of man that he should repent? Has he said and shall he not make it good? You know, has he spoken? Will he not make it good? Um, that actually came from Balaam. That was really cool. Well, at any rate, um, he does not do what the king says. So then the story in Numbers chapter 22, 23, 24, 25, it ends there. <laughs> But the next thing you see in the story in Numbers is the king Balak sending in the women to seduce the men through feasts and festivities and drunken orgies. And then it really ticks God off. And he has to go in and stop it. And it finally culminates when one of the priests goes in and sticks a spear through two people while they're in the position. And he kills them. Okay? And that puts a stop to the plague that was going on because plague had broken out. Now, it's not until Numbers 31 that you hear what the advice was that Balaam offered. On his way out, he said, listen, listen, you came out to pay me. I'm, I'm willing to do what it takes, but I can't do that. But if you can't beat them, let me show you how to corrupt them. I'll show you how to get God to curse his own people because he won't let me do it. I'll earn your paycheck, buddy. Here's what you need to do. You need to send in your women to seduce them. This is Numbers 31, verse 16. It tells where the doctrine of Balaam specifically is. This is also re-mentioned again in 1 Peter and also, I believe, in Jude. Where, the doct- or where Balaam is mentioned. And he, he talks about this. Now, this is important because... What did he do? He got the people to embrace pagan worship, revelry, drunkenness, and sexual immorality. Hey, listen, you want to worship God? You want to really worship God? Let's have some sex. That euphoric moment. And we don't, we don't want to limit this. I mean, let's not be narrow-minded. I mean, I get that you're married, but listen, our God allows us to, to branch out. You know what I'm saying? It's perfectly acceptable to sleep with other people. And, 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 and to really kick it off right, we really need to have some good feasting and some drinking and a drunken orgy. And that's really the way to get the job done. Now, okay, that being said, so we see the doctrine of Balaam, and then you see another word, the Nicolaitans, that brings us back to the word in verse 13, Antipas. Now go ahead and say what you're going to say on Antipas. Oh, um, uh, microphone. The, his name means like father. Like father. <laughs> there was another way that this is, this is uh, uh, broken down. Anti, meaning anti-against. And the pass is the papacy. So it would be, again, looking at church history. Not just a moment in, like, these guys. I'm just thinking of where God says, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and, and if you were to say, Sexual immorality is wrong. And I'm, in, I'm standing in opposition to a doctrinal head who thinks that he's the Nicolaitans above the laity who's telling us that sexual immorality is okay and paganism is okay to stand in opposition to that, to stand opposed to that, anti that. Who would they opposition be the papacy incidentally in church history and we still celebrate things today in louisiana called mardi gras anybody ever hear mardi gras yeah. i went to tulsa and we you know went to a mardi gras and there was a lot of drinking and a lot of naked ladies 
Yeah. And I'm thinking, why am I here? <laughs> why am I here? This ain't right. And, and uh, not good. Isn't you know, the beads, the festival of the beads. Yeah. Yes, New Orleans. 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 What did I say? Louisiana? Yeah, yeah. Louisiana and New Orleans. Well, what is Mardi Gras? It's the day before the day of confession. Well, what do you do now? You go get out all your ambitions. Well, who started Mardi Gras? The Pope. Roman Catholicism. What did they do? They said that you can go be sexually immoral because tomorrow your sins will be forgiven if you pay. To stand in opposition to that would make you somebody like Martin Luther who did stand in opposition and John Wycliffe who lost his life standing against the church because it was corrupt. And these people were persecuted, ridiculed, torn apart, beat down for the sake of, of standing in opposition to the Pope. Or a compound Greek word would be Antipas. Just a thought. So we looked up Antipas. Oh, it switched. Just a second. Okay, so apparently Antipas was martyred during the reign of Nero in 15 or 54 to 68 I'm guessing AD that would only be speculative though yeah because that's not uh it cannot be traced directly in church history okay but, but it, was, good it was by burning in a brazen bowl shaped altar and the reason why was for casting out demons worshiped by the local pe- population He yeah. was casting out basically demons that the people like that would have basically been the manifest gods that they were worshiping. And the people rose up against them, put them in a bowl and burned them to death. Let me read what this says uh, about the uh, person of Antipas. Um, let me find a good place to begin. It says, among the, uh, the historists and the futurists, that's one of the four ways that you could break down the views of Revelation. It says, Pergamos is seen as representing the imperial church after Constantine. That would have been between 313 uh, AD, in this case, they say, to 606, uh, wherein the church ceased to be officially persecuted and obtained access to the portals of political power. Pergamos is alleged... Uh, meaning married to power to power it was during this time that the institution of the papacy had its inception in 313 the decree of coronation made rome where satan's throne is the center of christendom like israel in the days of balaam the church of this period was being seduced into immorality and the worship of idols through the rise of the papal system. Some who take this approach have suggested that Antipas does not refer to an individual, but to a class of men opposed or anti to the popes or the papists, which men were martyred in great numbers in Rome and in Constantinople. Uh, Christ threatens to fight this institution with the sword out of his mouth, i.e. his word. Okay, now that being said, guys, we do not know what exactly Jesus meant when he said this word, the name Antipas. It could be, like you said, a beautiful uh, uh, in favor of the uh, of father, or what was it, in favor of? or Like father. Like father. Okay, and in any way, what we do know from this is Jesus is basically tipping his hat. He said, this is mine. This man is mine. Or these men are mine, however you want to view it. Is this one person or is this capturing an idea of several persons? In either case, Jesus is saying they're mine. They're doing the right thing. They're being martyred for my sake up against what? The doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Okay? Does that make some sense? And then, then he says, those who overcome. 
Uh, well, let's read verse 16. Uh, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, incidentally, and we'll have to probably finish with this. We've got eight minutes. Ready? Mm -hmm. um, and the hidden manna. Okay. What is that? What is that about? Manna was seen during the time of the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. Yes. Okay? As soon as they crossed over the Jordan River, that day the manna stopped. Okay? The Bible said so. Mm -hmm. And it was in the Ark of the Covenant there were three things that we know from the scriptures that were inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Does anybody know what they are? Paul, do you know what they are? Ten the three things that were inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ten Commandments, that's one. Aaron's staff. Aaron's staff and, and manna. And manna. And manna. A jar of manna. Okay? Except for God said do on one, this, just this one. Um, they could save it on, on Friday night so that it's good for Saturday, their, their Sabbath day. Okay, but after that, get out there and collect it. Don't store it up the next day. Eat only what today is. In other words, trust me for today. I will provide your daily bread. Tomorrow, I'll do it again. I am faithful. And he's showing them. Now, at this point in time, the, th the third thing that was stored inside of the Ark of the Covenant was manna. Now, why is this important? Because... During the time of the siege, when the children of Israel were taken into Babylon, the Ark of the Covenant mysteriously disappeared. Jeremiah, the prophet, one of the prophets, the weeping prophet, he has said, church tradition in history, in Jewish tradition in history, is said that he took the Ark of the Covenant. Now, archaeologists, such as like Ron Wyatt, uh, amateur archaeologist, believes that he found it. I have no problems with his evidence. I'll go on record to say, I think that he got it. I think that he knows, well, before he died, he, he, he saw it, and, and, but he could not touch it. He couldn't do anything. That being said, um, uh, there are history and traditions that say that Jeremiah took it to Africa. And I've seen some amazing, wonderful documentaries that believe to see the Ark of the Covenant travel down to Ethiopia. Why Ethiopia? Because there was a great, um, under Solomon, he, and, and, and what was the queen of the Ethiopians? Shiva. 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 Yeah, she came up and she was very, wow, wow, look at this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he showed her the ark and, and just showed her all everything. And she was just blown away and amazed. And uh, some traditions have it that uh, uh, people in Ethiopia actually believe that these traditions are legit. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really care. Um, that they had kids together. And she went home pregnant, and so offspring are there. Well, then during this time, Jeremiah could have went to Africa and taken it to some of David's lineage through Solomon, mm -hmm. who was a voracious appetite <laughs> for women. <laughs> um, and so that's where the... the now, at any rate, when Jesus comes onto the scene... Okay, after the siege where they come back after 70 years, they come back and then the temple is rebuilt, the second temple. And then Jesus is standing there and he's walking through the temple through Jerusalem and he says, who do people say that I am? They said Isaiah or one of the prophets. What is one of the prophets that they mentioned? Jeremiah. Why did they attribute him to be like Jeremiah? Because they asked him about manna. Remember? Mm -hmm. They said, give us manna to eat like Moses did in the wilderness. Why would they attribute him to Jeremiah and then link him up to manna? Because the ark went missing on Jeremiah's watch. And so now it's hidden manna. Mm -hmm. okay. And Jesus is saying right here, mm -hmm. I will give that hidden manna. Mm -hmm. Now he's not Jeremiah. Jesus is not Jeremiah. Jesus is Jesus. Oh, that's right here in verse 17. Uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give 
some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, that's some history behind this passage, behind this verse. Why does he say this? Why does Jesus say this? Because these people still are looking for the Ark of the Covenant in this time. And they're looking for that hidden manna. And Jesus is coming up and saying, I'll give that to you. I'll give that to you. That's mine to give to you. It's his ark, his covenant. But does that mean that he will give them the ark? That's not necessarily what that means. What it does mean is that I am the manna. Remember Jesus said, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. That's me. Yo, hey, John 8, right? Is it John 8? I believe it's John 8. And at any rate, um, Jesus says, I'm the true. They said, give us the bread that came down from heaven. I am the bread that came down from heaven. What the heck are you guys talking about? Well, we take communion. The, the you know, Jesus, the bread. Jesus' body, Jesus' blood, right? Um, But all that to say, even if he's not talking about and referencing the Ark of the Covenant or Jeremiah, the fact of the matter still remains that Jesus will give us his manna, his manna to eat for those who overcome. Okay, that's a promise to the overcoming ones, the overcomers. Now that's very important because I believe that Jesus is going to fulfill every single one of these. The white stone, the crown of life, the the forgiveness of sins, the the bread from heaven. uh, And and we looked at previous ones. You know, I will give to him the tree of life. And every single one of these references, it always refers back to life eternal with him in heaven. Amen? Amen? Very good. I did it in six minutes. Any other questions, comments, or thoughts before we leave? Microphone. What was? Okay. What is the what? Numbers twenty-two through twenty-five, and then it specifically mentions it in Numbers thirty-one verse sixteen. But also you can read about it in Jude. There's only one chapter. Twenty-two through what? Twenty-two through twenty-five in Numbers twenty-two through twenty-five. Okay. Then also Numbers chapter thirty-one verse sixteen, and then also we see it in Jude. There's only one chapter, so chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, Jude speaks about it, and then also, I believe, it's in Peter. Uh, okay, so there's several times um, Balaam is mentioned, and it's mm-hmm. never mentioned in a positive way. Why? Because he taught Balak how to corrupt and destroy the people of God. Oh, by the way, that corruption is still happening today. How many Christians think that, uh, well, we don't want to use the word sexual immorality, so we'll just call it fornication. We're not even going to call it that because the Bible calls it that, and we're just that. We're just going to call it living together. Mm-hmm. Hold up. As a Christian, that's the doctrine of Balaam, and that's the doctrine of compromise. If you don't like it, right? you can't stop it. The Bible has in, you know, ha, ha, the Bible gives us the answers. If you don't, you know, like that and you can't stop it, the Bible says very clearly it's better to marry than to burn with passion. If you can't keep a good, a good handle on yourself, you can't grab yourself by the scruff of the neck and say, hey, I cannot do this before God. I will not do this before God. Then you better, you better do what's right. That's right. Get married. Okay? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day, this evening, that we can come and study uh, this book, your book. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, encourage us, direct us, correct us, lead us, guide us. Father, we want to be faithful. We want to be overcomers. We want to endure through the the tests, the trials, the tribulations. We want to be able to stand before you, knowing that we stood in the face of false doctrine uh, and we did not compromise, knowing that we stood in the face of uh, immorality and we stood strong because we love you and we want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So Father, I pray that you would stir us up, stir us up, strengthen us, and where we find ourselves weak and stumbling and falling, Father, I pray that you would forgive us of our sins and cause us to make a a come about, to repent, and to walk in righteousness. We love you, and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray.
Amen.